we are going to reformulate the Gram-Schmidt procedure and find that we have another decomposition of a matrix A, namely the QR decomposition. We will then explore the application of the QR decomposition to the normal equation. And finally, we'll have our usual takeaway. Let me remind you about the Gram-Schmidt procedure. The Gram-Schmidt procedure starts with a given set of vectors V and transforms them to orthogonal vectors W and takes these orthogonal vectors and scales them to unit length, ending up with a set of vectors Q1 through QK that are orthonormal and span the exact same space as the Ws. One comment about the computations that we have to do when we compute the projections, these quantities V dotted W over W dot W in the W direction, is that that W occurs twice above the fraction and twice below the fraction. So that if I were to rescale my Ws, if I were to say replace them by a scale factor times W, then W tilde dot V over W tilde dot W tilde times W tilde is equal to, well, I'll have a two alphas in the numerator and alpha squared in the denominator, and it works out to the exact same projection that I had before, the exact same projection operation. So I can replace any one of these terms in the projection with another term that is the w vector scaled in some appropriate fashion. Typically what I'm going to do for hand computations is I'm going to scale the w's so that they do not have fractions. We will now reorder the Gram-Schmidt procedure equations. We are going to write the v's in terms of the w's. So push all the projections to the other side. And what we see then is that v1 is equal to a scale factor times q1. v2 is equal to scale factors times q1 plus q2. And continue that way. So each of the v's can be expressed as a linear combination of the q's, and therefore each of the v's can be written as a matrix times the vectors q, times those uh, vectors q1, q2 through qn. So what we see is that a is equal to a matrix q, whose columns are the q1, q2, q3 vectors, times a matrix r made up of these coefficients. So we have rewritten the matrix A formed from the original vectors V in terms of vectors Q1 through Qn. And putting these into a matrix, we now have A is equal to QR, where R is a triangular matrix that has the length of the Ws on the diagonal that serves to switch from the Q vectors to the A vectors. Now notice that I don't have the same index on these two sets of equations. Namely, if one of the v's happen to be in the span of the vectors that you already saw, if we didn't have an orthogonal component, well, then it would not provide a new orthogonal vector. In which case, the simplest way to deal with that is to throw it out and use the remaining vectors. So any one v that is a linear combination of previous v's will not enter in that computation. So let's phrase that observation in terms of the theorem. So we are given a matrix A of size m by n, and we found that therefore we can factor that matrix A into a matrix Q times R, such that Q has orthonormal columns, so Q transpose Q is equal to I, and that R is an upper triangular matrix. In addition, if the columns of A are linearly independent, then that matrix R has the length of the vectors W on the diagonal, that matrix R is invertible. So the Gram-Schmidt procedure actually constructs these matrices, and the non-zero entries of R are the coefficients that we have already computed when we run the Gram-Schmidt procedure. The way that books usually present it is they have you run the Gram-Schmidt procedure and at the very end, once you have the matrix A and the matrix Q, you know that A is equal to QR. So rather than try and figure out the coefficients and reassemble them, the easier way is to multiply through by Q transpose and solve this equation for R, namely R is equal to Q transpose A. We will find an easier way of doing that, however. So let's look at the sample computation and the first method I'll label as the naive method, the method that we are going to use for hand computations. 
it is going to prove advantageous to lay out the computations in matrix form. So I'm going to define a couple of matrices. The matrix A is going to be the matrix made up of my original vectors written in as columns. The matrix W is going to be the matrix of my new vectors W that I obtained from the Vs. And then I will have to have a scaling matrix, which is a diagonal matrix. And what I want on the diagonal is one divided by the length of the W. Here is how the layout looks. The matrix A, and we'll start filling in the Ws. And as we fill in the Ws, we are going to rewrite them to the left in the next layer down as the transpose of each one of the Ws, and we are going to compute the dot products. So rather than focus on that layout of the computations right now, let me give you an example and we'll see how it works. So here's my matrix A written in this layout, and I'm going to try and compute the QR decomposition from. Let's start the computation. The very first step, once I've got my matrix A, is to compute W1. And W1 is just set w1 equal to v1. So let's write in w1, and let's compute all of the dot products that we can now compute. Namely, we will need the w's, the dot products of the w's with the v's, and the current w itself. So let's write that w here into this second matrix as a transpose, and compute the dot products. So right here is the dot product of w1 with v1, the dot product of w2 with v2, the dot product of W3 with V3, and the dot product of W1 with W1. If you check the Gram-Schmidt equations, you'll see that indeed those are the exact dot products that you're going to need as you go further in the computation. The next step is to compute W2. So we've computed as many of the dot products as we can. We now switch to W2. So my Gram-Schmidt procedure equation is W2 is V2 minus V2 dot W1 over W1 in the W1 direction. So V2 minus the W1 times some scale factor. The scale factor, V2 dot W1, I've already computed. It's right here, W1 dotted with V2. And the denominator, W1 dot W1, is right here. So we just plug in to reduce everything to the same denominator to make the computation simpler. And we get a vector w2, which is 1 half times that vector 3, 1, minus 2. And rather than carry that fraction 1 half around, we'll simply scale it out. We'll use w tilde, the vector 3, 1, minus 2 instead. So now I've got my second vector. I'll write it into my matrix w. I'll write it into the corresponding matrix as a transpose and I'll compute all the dot products that I can. Now, the W2 dotted with V1, W2 dotted with V2, W2 dotted with V3, W2 dotted with W1, and W2 dotted with W2. Now, there are two zeros in this line here that are of interest that have to happen. Let me look at this first zero. It's W2 dotted with V1. But W2 is orthogonal to V1 by construction. That's how we chose W2. Therefore, that dot product has to be zero. Similarly over here, W2 dot W1. W1 and W2 are orthogonal. So again, we have to have a zero here. And actually, we have to have a zero in both places. If you check, if you give these matrices names, if I call this the W matrix, then this is the W transpose matrix. And the matrix product I'm computing in here, well, the first matrix is W transpose times A. The second matrix here is W transpose times W. W transpose W is a symmetric matrix. So any zeros below the diagonal have to be matched with zeros above the diagonal. So I really only need to compute one of these. I am guaranteed that the other one will be the exact same value. Now I have W2. So we are going to next compute W3. W3 we obtain in the exact same way. It's V3 minus V3 dot W1 over W1 dot W1 in the W1 direction minus V3 dot W2, etc. And plugging that in, here is V3 minus a quotient times W1 minus a quotient times W2. And the quotients, again, we already pre-computed in our matrix layer. Let's find them. V3 dot W1, 
well, w1 and v3 right here, w1.w1 right here, v3.w2, v3 is this column, dot w2, that's here, w2.w2 is right here, and again in that computation when we plug in, we have found the appropriate zeros, now when we plug in, when we compute the resulting matrix series, we're going to again reduce to the same denominator. We're lucky the third vector didn't enter. We happen to have a zero here. And scaling out that factor of one third, we get one third times the vector minus two, four, minus one. And so I'll choose minus two, four, minus one. Although I could pull out any scale factor. So I could pull out minus one third, for example, and choose the vector two, minus four plus one instead. So put that vector in, write it in as a transpose into my W transpose matrix and finish the dot product. And again, we see the zeros appear, namely that W3 is orthogonal to V1 and V2 and W3 is orthogonal to W1 and orthogonal to W2. So at this point, I've computed all my Ws. What I have to do next is I have to scale my Ws to unit length. Look here. This matrix here has W1 dot W1 on the diagonal. That's the square of the length of W1. W2 dot W2, the square of the length of W2. W3 dot W3, the square of the length of W3. So I have to scale by 1 divided by the square root of 6 for the W1 vector by 1 over square root of 14 for the W2 vector, and by 1 over the square root of 21 for the W3 vector. Well, the W1 vector is right here. So that I have to scale by 1 over square root of 6. So 1 over square root of 6 times the first row, the W1 vector, plus 0 times W2 plus 0 times W3 is going to give me Q1. So when I carry out this multiplication here, I'll find Q1 in the first row. Second row, the W2 vector, 3, 1, minus 2. It has to be scaled by 1 over square root of 14. Well, Walter likes to put that square root of 14 in the numerator instead. It's the exact same value. This time, it's the second row of my W transpose matrix I have to scale. This is my Q2 vector written in as a row. And similarly for the third vector, this is Q3 written in as a row. Now, it's going to prove advantageous to multiply that scale factor, not just into the first matrix, into the W matrix, but also into the W transpose A matrix. And let's think about that. We want to get to A is equal to Q times R. And we just found the transpose of Q right here. And the transpose of Q was this matrix, let's call it S, S times the transpose of the W matrix, S W transpose. So Q transpose is equal to S W transpose. And we know R. R is just Q transpose times A. Well, Q transpose is S W transpose, therefore S W transpose times A. And that matrix here is W transpose A. So all I have to do is scale that matrix by my S matrix to obtain R. So scale the first row by 1 over square root of 6. Scale the second row by 1 over square root of 14. Scale the third row by 1 over square root of 21. And I'll have R appearing right here. So no need to go back and multiply Q transpose times A to find that third matrix here. We've already done the work. Something else to notice here is that we have a built-in error check. So let's see what happens here. The computation, the way we're doing it, is we're proceeding one vector w at a time, and we fill out the matrix multiplications as we go. And we've already noticed that there are some zeros that have to appear. Namely, if I go back to my matrix layout, the w transpose w matrix here has to be diagonal. Each of the wi's has to be orthogonal to all the other w's. The second point is that the R matrix has to be upper triangular, so I have to have these zeros here. So suppose I do my computations and I make a mistake. So as before, I have my matrix A, I found the W1, which is equal to V1, and did my computation, and now I have an error in my W2 vector. I have a minus sign error. 
So now when I do my computation with that W2 transpose dot V1, I expect it to see a zero here, and I don't. Or similarly, if I check W1 and dot it with W2, I expect a zero here. Those vectors should be orthogonal, and I don't see it. So rather than proceeding with the remaining computation at this point, the remaining computation depends on my getting W2 right. So if I don't see this pattern of zeros that I expect, I'm not going to proceed with the next computation. I'm going to stop and fix my error, make sure that I get the zeros before going on. Let's do a second example. Here, I'm setting up a matrix A. Here's my matrix corresponding of the vectors V1, V2, V3. And the purpose of this example is just to show you that I do not necessarily have to have a square matrix for my matrix A. So my vector V1, V2, and V3, and we proceed with our driving equations with our gram schmidt equation. So the very first thing is we okay. pick W1, we fill in W1, W1 transpose, and compute all of the dot products that we can now see, and W1 dotted with V1, with V2, with V3, and W1 dotted with itself. Next, proceed to the second gram schmidt equation, so W2 is V2 minus a quotient times W1. And when you run that computation, when you plug in reading out of the matrix, you get W2 is equal to a fraction times a W1 vector. And again, we'll simply drop the fraction and use this W2 tilde vector instead. So 1 minus 3 minus 1. one. We'll fill that in to our matrix and in the matrix W and in the matrix W transpose compute all of the dot products that we can compute now, and make sure that we see the zeros that we expect to see. The zeros are where we want them, so I guess we haven't made a mistake yet, so let's proceed to W3. My third Gram-Schmidt equation is W3 is V3 minus the quotient times W1 minus this quotient times W2, and it multiplies out to one-third times the vector 1, 0, 2, 1. And again, we'll drop that fraction out front. We'll just keep 1, 0, 2, 1 as my third vector. So plug that into our W matrix, plug it into our W transpose matrix, compute all of the dot products that we can now compute, and we've finished with our first set of equations. And the last step in Grand Schmidt is to scale the Qs, and therefore we have to take the S matrix, the scaling matrix, it's just the inverse square root of WW transpose. So 4 to the minus 1 half, 12 to the minus 1 half, 6 to the minus 1 half, written on a diagonal. So that's our scaling matrix. And now scale each one of the rows. So apply the scale factor 1 half to the first row of the first two equations here. Apply the scale factor square root of 3 over 6 to the second row of these two matrices, and the third factor, square root of 6 over 6, to the third row of these two matrices. And the result is that you'll have found the transpose of the Q matrix, Q transpose right here, and the R matrix right here. So we have obtained the factorization A is equal to Q times R, and we therefore can simply write it down. So S is equal to that scaling matrix, the Q transpose, add was the W transpose with that scaling matrix multiplied in. The R matrix was W transpose times A with that scaling matrix multiplied in. This method actually works very well when I do exact computations. In practice, with numbers where I do not have exact arithmetic, we run into trouble a little bit. So there's a refinement of the method that you can apply that works quite well. Actually, there's two of them. The first one is to notice that when I do my computation, when I compute those QIs, if you look back at our equation over here, I I'm going to subtract off that W1 contribution from V2. I can subtract it off immediately. That whatever that contribution is, I can subtract it off of all of the other Vs and use these as an intermediate value before I do my next projection. 
So that idea of removing the Q components as we go improves the numerical property. A second refinement that we can apply is to say, well, we started out with the Vs in some order and our naive method simply used the Vs in that exact order. But maybe that's not a good idea. If two vectors are close together in the sense that they point in almost the same direction, then that orthogonal piece I'm going to compute is going to be very small. So it might be advantageous to reorder the vectors at every step. And so in effect, what we're doing is full pivoting. Both of these ideas greatly improve the numerical behavior of that method. Computer codes do not use the naive methods. They will remove the QI components as we go, and they will reorder the remaining vectors as we go. Although I don't necessarily have to do QR, I don't necessarily have to compute that Q using the Gram-Schmidt procedure. There are alternate methods that are also extremely successful. Basically, they start from the matrix A, and instead of trying to get Q out of that matrix A, they go from A to an upper triangular matrix R by using orthonormal transformations. And the transformations that tend to get used are reflections, taking a vector and pushing it to a coordinate axis. And that method is named after householder, so householder reflections. Similarly, I can take a vector A and rotate it onto an axis that is named after Givens as Givens rotation. So alternate methods to compute the QR factorization. Now I'd like to show you an application of using QR. QR is an extremely successful factorization that has many, many uses. And the use I want to show you has to do with the normal equation. I have a matrix A, and I'd like to compute AX is equal to B, but if B has an orthogonal component, then that doesn't have a solution. The equation that has a solution is AX is equal to B minus whatever that orthogonal component is. And then what we did is we took dot products with the vectors A, because they are orthogonal to that component, and that gets rid of that extra component. Well, the A's and the W's correspond to the same subspace. The com space of A and the com space of the W's is the same. So if instead I take dot products with the W's, I'll also wipe out that orthogonal component. So we think about replacing the multiplication by A transpose that we see in the normal equation by multiplication by W transpose, better yet, by Q transpose, since those are orthonormal vectors. Here is the theorem. We can indeed do that. So if we take a matrix A and we have found its QR factorization Q times R, then A transpose AX equals A transpose B reduces to RX is equal to Q transpose B. Here's the proof. So we start with A equals QR, and we are going to assume that A has full column rank, so all of our Vs indeed have orthogonal components to the subspace of the previous Vs. And therefore, when we do our QR decomposition, everything works exactly as we have described it here, that R matrix is going to be upper triangular with the length of the Ws on the diagonal, and therefore that matrix R is invertible, and so is that transpose of that matrix. So A is equal to QR, and if I take the transpose, A transpose is R transpose Q transpose. So let's look at the normal equation. I start from AX equals B, and I'm multiplying A transpose. So A transpose AX equals A transpose B. And I'm substituting QR for the A. So I'll get R transpose Q transpose times QR times X is equal to R transpose Q transpose times B. Now R is invertible. So we can multiply through by the inverse. So for the R's cancel out, they become R inverse times R is equal to I. And I'm left with Q transpose Q times Rx is equal to Q transpose B. But Q is a matrix of orthogonal vectors. So Q transpose Q is equal to I, and I end up with Rx is equal to Q transpose B, just as stated. So instead of solving the normal equation as written, I can find the QR decomposition of that matrix A and solve Rx equals Q transpose B instead. For Hand computations, I'm not going to use A equals QR. 
I'll remember that R is actually that scaling matrix S times W transpose A, and Q transpose is that scaling matrix times the W transposes. And so what I'll do is I'll undo those scale factors. I'll get rid of those square roots. So instead of solving Rx equals Q transpose V, I'll simply multiply through by W transpose and solve W transpose AX equals W transpose B instead. Here's an example. Suppose I get myself these two vectors, A1 and A2, and I want to compute the orthogonal decomposition of B onto the span of those vectors and its orthogonal component. So the application of the normal equation that we had been doing last time around. When I do my QR decomposition, I take my vectors, I compute the Ws, I compute all the dot products as before, and now I can either read out the R X is equal to Q transpose times B out of the third level of this computational layer. Or I can read out W transpose, the matrix 7 minus 2, 0, 15 times X is equal to W transpose times B. So I set up that multiplication of this W transpose matrix with the B vector. When I multiply that, when I write down what that equation is, here it is, 7 minus 2, 0, 15, a nice upper triangular matrix times that vector x. But it can be solved trivially, and we get that x is equal to 1 third times the vector 2, 1. That is the solution of the normal equation. So my decomposition, therefore, is to simply take that solution and compute a times x, and I get the parallel component, 1, 1, 0, 1. And the orthogonal component is B minus that parallel component as before, the vector 1, 0, 1, minus 1. And as a check, I can verify these two vectors are indeed orthogonal. I can verify that their dot product is 0. So 1 times 1 plus 0 plus 0 minus 1 indeed multiplies out to 0. So our takeaway for today is as follows. We have reformulated the Gram-Schmidt procedure. We've shown that it yields A is equal to Q times R, where Q has also normal columns. It's not necessarily square. The second example had that matrix A that wasn't square and had linearly independent vectors in it. So Q transpose is not necessarily the inverse of a matrix Q. When it's not square, there's no inverse overall. Q, Q transpose will not be equal to I. If Q happens to be squared, then yes, matrix Q is orthonormal, is orthogonal. The R matrix in that decomposition in A equals QR simply switches the Q vectors back to the A vectors. And if I multiply by the inverse, the inverse of R switches the A vectors to the Q vectors. The decomposition is very widely used in American computation. Multiplying by Q or Q transpose is numerically nice. The application I've shown you for that decomposition is that I can solve the normal equation as Rx equals Q transpose B. And in fact, A is equal to QR. It is used everywhere. 